What is up, you guys? Matt McKeever here, and so by massive popular demand, Casey's back. I bought this building in uh, 2013. It was for 3.15 million, and this is a 51 bed uh, oh, wow. student house. Yeah, student housing. That's so 51 awesome. bed. Uh, gross rent is 27,000 gross rent per month. We bought this is 12 units, nine towns, and then um, some uh, some duplexes. Over oh, there. okay, yeah. We bought this for 1.35 mil. This is literally a five minute walk to Google's head office. The LRT is here. Uh, this is really, really strong location wise. This is 36 units. Uh, this is what, again, what I like to specialize is two, two, two to two and a half story walk ups. It's 36 units, bought it for 4.3 uh, mil. Uh, and then we sold the back half to a developer. So I bought this in 2004. I bought it for 430,000. Wow. 10 units, okay? Yeah. So that's $43,000. Guys, real investors, real people, <laughs> real streets, yeah. real buildings. <laughs> What is up, YouTube? Matt McKeever here. And if you guys haven't been paying attention, we've been doing this YouTube thing now for, well, over four years. And we've had a lot of opportunities come across a lot of interesting real estate investors, you know, financial independence oriented people, as well as firepreneurs. All kinds of crazy characters have came across the YouTube channel, but there's a few that stand out maybe amongst all the others. And definitely one of the guys on my channel that you guys love to see is Casey Wong. So we thought, why not just go through the hours and hours, dozens of hours, actually probably hundreds of hours. We might even be close to a thousand hours now of raw Casey Wong footage. And we thought, why not just like uncover maybe some hidden gems, go back and clip some of our favorite pieces as well. And so right now I've got more than an hour of Casey Wong for you guys. I hope you enjoy it. We're going to be talking a lot about multifamily properties. This is really going back to the first and second time I met up with Casey. So really excited to be bringing you guys this new and favorite content. Hey guys, Matt McKeever here coming to you from Waterloo. We're actually just like pretty much across the street from uh, Laurier University. So really excited. We're here today with a RAIN member, a RAIN alumni, uh, hey Casey. So I don't know if you want to say a little bit about uh, yourself or whether we'll just jump into the tour. Just jump right in. Okay, so let's just jump into the tour. So Casey's going to give us a tour today. We got uh, Adam as cameraman number two. So hopefully we're going to get some decent footage, Adam. <laughs> nice. So yeah, do you mind talking about this building a bit, Casey? Sure. I bought this building in uh, 2013. Um, essentially, it was for 3.15 million. Yeah. It seems very high, um, so mm -hmm. I had to raise. Uh, I thought I had to raise 25 percent, which just winds up to be about let's say 900,000. Yeah. So about 900,000. I didn't have that. Uh, so right here, right in the parking lot, I spoke to the owner with my agent and his agent, and we were starting. We started to talk. We talked talked about VTBs and whatnot. Yeah. And he goes, "Hey, this is not bad because." Uh, he doesn't know what to do with his money. So he lent me 12.5% of the purchase price, which is okay. 480000 or whatever. Yeah. So I had to raise about 480000 as well. So what that means is that I was talking to him. I didn't have to raise as much. He took a VTB. He's in second position. Anything goes wrong, he can take back his property. Plus mm -hmm. he defers his taxes, which is a bonus for him. Also, what I was negotiating is that um, with, I'll just say his name is Tom, yeah. because his name is Tom. <laughs> um, he uh, his his rate was actually less than my first mortgage. My my first is actually with Community Trust. Oh, okay. So this is three point one five. I had to get I had to raise four hundred and eighty thousand approximately, mm -hmm. and I didn't know what the heck to do because <laughs> that was a lot at that time at yeah twenty thirteen. That, that for me that was a lot of money, and I didn't want to sell any of my properties. So I actually this is a start like this was my upgrade. Um, oh, was this this was the first big building for you? I had a ten plex in Kitchener downtown Kitchener oh, okay. as well, um, but this fun like on a dollar figure, yeah. 3.15 was expensive. Yeah. So when people start jumping into it, it seems expensive, but um, once you put everything in place, and I was trying to look for um, investors and whatnot, I couldn't find any. Yeah. Um, one investor bailed on me and said that, you know what, <laughs> I won't go for this, but I'll lend you 200,000 at 8%. Nice. Oh, that's nice. That shit. Deal. You know what? Yeah, that's, that's actually deal, man, better, curve. yeah, that's better. Like, that, right? I paid him off, and then I refied this actually last week. Um, so I took the money out, and. Mm -hmm. uh, Essentially, I just pushed the mortgage back out, CMHC, I pushed it back out to 35 years. Yeah. Uh, cash flow is stronger. Um, and this is a 51 bed uh, oh, wow. student house. Yeah, student housing. That's so 51 awesome. bed. Uh, gross rent is 27,000 gross rent per month. Okay. But what, what I mean by this is not a value add is that 
I'm not raising the rents. The rents are already at that market, so you mm -hmm. have to do your analysis and say, hey, if this is the market rent, what can I do to change it, uh, get that expense lower? Yeah. Right? So I'm not, for, for some things, let's say for another building, I can, uh, the rents are low, let's say it's $900 for one bedroom, mm -hmm. uh, 1000 for a two. You can bump it up to, let's say, 11 or 1200 1300 or whatnot, whatever that market rent is. This one I can. But when I looked at this, take a picture of that. Yeah. Um, this is it, this is the mechanical. So when you're looking at the mechanical, there's nothing, there's no boiler. I only have two hot water tanks. Yeah. For the front half of the building, I have a back half of the building. So what this means is that this is baseboard heating. Mm -hmm. It's definitely meter. They pay for all that. So my expense is really low, right? Yeah. So let's say, you, let's say your, your top line is, because uh, I rent these out for about almost $1,600 a unit for a three bedroom. If my top line is 1600 I can't raise it anymore. I'm gonna have to do something with the with my bottom portion, which is my expense, right? And that 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 little uh, yeah. margin, which we'll call NOI, that margin, that NOI, you just increase that. Yeah, either you increase it upwards or you de decrease it downwards, right? Mm -hmm. So that's that portion that you want. You want a bigger NOI. Yeah. If that net operating income is higher, then that increases the prices of the building, right? Mm -hmm. Very very simple. So because I don't have a boiler system, I'm not paying for gas, water I charge back. They pay for hydro. Shit, I don't pay for anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right? It's beautiful. So that's what you want to do. It's like, again, this is not a value add. This is mm -hmm. a student housing. Student housing, sometimes uh, I get the guarantor from the, from the parents and whatnot. But students are actually super easy. And they don't. Yeah. If, you, if, you, if you do your regular inspections and whatnot, uh, you know how to run it. It's actually not very difficult. Yeah, it's actually really interesting. A lot of people will give me flack at first about student rentals, right? They're like, Oh, they're going to destroy your properties. Like it's going to be nothing but headaches. Yeah. But yeah, student housing. This is this is something that I don't normally do. This is uh, not a value add. But be because of this situation, um, there's no boiler. There's yeah. no recirc lines. Um, Just it's really a lot. Simple. Very very simple. So how did this property get on your radar? It how was on. It? it was on MLS. Oh, okay. Uh, this one usually when we purchase, it's not. Um, it's not listed. Yeah. Uh, it's usually quick, private, or whatnot. Um, but something like this, um, it was real quick. It was like one or two days. I met the uh, the owner in the parking lot, and I yeah. think there's another there's another group as well. So they came, nice fancy car. I came in my Toyota Matrix, right? Yeah. So I was like, you know, let's take a look. I, I didn't think I get. I always give several offers. I, I give three offers. Yeah. Nice. One was um, twenty percent uh, VTB of the purchase yeah. price. Yeah. And I said, I won't give you 3.15, I'll give 3.2, right? And then I dropped the, uh, the rate down. I think I dropped the rate, whatever worked out, I think I dropped the rate down a little bit lower, uh, like two or 3%. Mm -hmm. Then I gave him, um, it was 12 and a half, of, so basically 50-50, yeah. and the rate was around, I said 5%. And then I said, hey, if you want, 2.8 or 2.7. Uh, cash, done, like I'll, I gave three offers, I said, here it is. Uh, because it's better to give an option. Yeah. It's not sure. usually if they give one, um, one offer, they're just gonna turn it down, right? Mm -hmm. So you give them three offer, like three three offers, and it's like, okay, yeah. let me look into it, right? So yeah. then he just came back and said, okay, well. Like the cover letter is a good approach too when you're yep. those three offers. You can't. Here's the way that's right. right. Here's cover letter is amazing. But I didn't have the cover letter because it just he was showing it, right? So fast, it happened yeah. so fast, right? But you just have to be on your toes, right? Yeah. So yeah. if you're willing to, you know, give an offer verbally, yeah. you know, put it down on paper after, right? And so again, this. So I would take annual inspections and whatnot for fire. Yeah. It's this building is actually pretty quiet uh, because of the construction. And so you manage all your own properties, right? Yeah. yeah. It's super easy. Yeah. Um, so do most of your tenants now do e-transfers or you no. still checks? Uh, yeah. Actually e-transfers, checks or PAD, so a pre-authorized oh, okay, debit. Yeah. Um, and I would pull. So in a building like this, I'm looking for concrete block and brick construction. Um, something that doesn't have a lot of deferred maintenance. When, I, when we bought this, I had minor stuff. This front step was um, completely wrecked. So all I did was um, get that changed. And that was only $1,800. Yeah. So it's not a lot. I put these uh, these uh, handrails. Railings. Yeah. Railings. You don't need it, but if somebody falls, mm -hmm. liability is on on me, right? Yeah. So I rather put it and I rather salt it, like over salt it, mm -hmm. and just make sure that there's no slip hazard, right? Yeah. Come on over. Yep. 
when I, uh... And so is there a certain way you approach a vendor when you're talking about vendor take backs or do you just, it's literally you include in one of your three options at least and see what happens? Most of them don't want it. Yeah. Um, but you can always ask. Mm -hmm. uh, we're doing a deal in right across from, uh, we're, oh, okay. asking, we're asking for a vendor take back and he didn't want it. I asked him yesterday, mm -hmm. he didn't want it. Obviously he's been, it's been in his business or it's been in his family for the last almost 50 years. Um, so he, he just wants to get out. So yeah. you can tell him the ben benefits and all that, but if it's not for him, it's not for him. Yeah. You can always ask. Uh, but Do you a lot find, of, like, if you try and really lay out the benefits and stuff, can you convince people, or is it usually like they have their mind made up from the start? Yeah, they usually have their mind made up if they don't know. Mm -hmm. um, like the gentleman Tom here for yeah. his Elgin Street property, uh, he didn't know, I don't think he knew too much about it, mm -hmm. but when he heard that, you know, it's there's a lien against this property, your second position, um, he excuse me, after that, he was a little more comfortable. Other than that, there wasn't a lot of work. I put that ramp there for uh, easy access for people moving in and out. Awesome. Um, plenty of parking here. So yeah. for some of the students, they want that. I think I, um, I didn't charge enough. Normally yeah. I, I put $30 a parking spot and I think people are charging a lot more. Um, so there is money here. <clears throat> My wife is always saying, you know what, I think your, your top line is not high enough right so i think this is this is the case so it's packed here so mm -hmm. um thirty dollars is probably going to be five fifty dollars a month yeah, yeah yeah for sure i can see that so definitely for that um other than that it's uh I, we bought this under our personal name it wasn't under corp uh the benefit to that was getting uh solar panels so i increased the uh the revenue as well um mm -hmm. they don't have a contract for like in ontario Depends on where you're investing, but in Ontario they had that back then, mm -hmm. and putting a solar panel system in was about 35k, and it generated yeah. about say four to five, four to six hundred dollars a month. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, per month. Uh, oh, that, yeah, mm -hmm. and there's no tenants. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. So, 20. Uh, it was a guaranteed contract from the government, um, and they automatically pay as long as the, uh, the energy that's generated goes goes back to the grid. Right? Yeah. You don't even yeah. see it. Yeah, no, yeah. I yeah. It, I Absolutely. It. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's about it. Very, very easy to uh, to manage. Cool. Yeah, this is an awesome building. This is definitely like this is the type of building I eventually want in my portfolio. So. But, but seriously, this is two hundred thousand. I put down. I know that's crazy. Two hundred thousand five years ago. Yeah. So it's not that bad. Mm -hmm. Right. It's unbelievable. I pay back my um, my friend. Uh, yeah. The two hundred. Actually, I put it in two seventy. I bought two hundred. Mm -hmm. So it was 270 in. Yep. Um, I paid back after two or three years. I paid that back 8%, uh, paid monthly. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I refi this uh, with a CMAC loan. Nice. Yeah. Right? That's awesome. Redoing interest only, that 8%? Your payments? Yeah, nice. exactly, 8%. Uh, interest only, um, principal at the end. Yeah, simple. So yeah, and then as far as like where you actually found those people to lend you the money, like I'm assuming that came from rain and networking and all. It was that. networking. Yeah. So Matt, I'm a little bit older than you, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I guess my my network, uh, yeah, they're a little bit older and they have some money, yeah, uh, under HELOC or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but my sort of my group is like 40 to 50 years old, yeah, and then uh, they do have some savings, mm -hmm. and they don't mind doing a HELOC. I give them eight, they pay three, they they, they make pocket the spread. Yeah, they yeah. make that spread, right? Very very simple. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome, man. Yeah. This is perfect. This is this is the exact type of properties, guys, I eventually want sure. to add it's to wonderful. the portfolio. This is fantastic. This is, again, and again, the way I met Casey was yeah. all through rain. It was just networking. I'm telling you guys all the time, you just need to be focused on networking. Smash that like button if you got value from this video. I know you did. If you're new to my channel, hit the subscribe button, and uh, we'll have some more videos with Casey coming up in the near future. Thanks, guys. Guys, we're just driving to Casey's next property. Bought this in, I don't even remember the year. This is four years ago. Three to, three, yeah, four years ago. This is literally a five minute walk to Google's head office. The LRT is here. Uh, this is really, really strong location wise. We bought, this is 12 units, nine towns, and then um, some, uh, some duplexes. Oh, okay, yeah. So this is uh, essentially 12 units. Uh, most of them are three bedroom, uh, three bedroom towns. Uh, we bought this for 1.35 mil. Which it seems, at that time I was like, wow. Actually, at that time I even said, no, but that's pretty cheap. Yeah. 12 units at 1.3. Yeah, million. no, that seems, yeah. Yeah, so it rents for about 13, I think 13, I don't even remember the numbers. I think it's 1395 or 13, 
it's about thirteen hundred dollars. They pay all the utilities except for water because water you can get that separated as well, but water uh, is a bulk meter. So I pay for the water. Everything mm -hmm. else they pay for. But at thirteen thirteen five, um, sorry, one thousand uh, one point three five million. This is a good. This is a good solid solid investment. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. When we bought it, there was again going back. There's some deferred maintenance. This is built in 1900s, like 1901 yes. or something. It's an older building. Um, the only major thing was um, there's water penetration into the basement, okay. into these two uh, in particular, and a little bit to uh, to the one over here on the corner. So it's one, two, three. So two, maybe half. Um, and then I got uh, when you're negotiating with the uh, with the vendor, I said, hey, you, you know, you have some water problems. The tenant's been telling you and you haven't dealt with it. So I basically said that either you deal with it or I deal with it. He got me a couple quotes and I said, I'd rather take the cash, right? Because mm -hmm. you don't want the vendor to do it. They're selling it. They'll probably, you know, cheap yeah. out or whatnot. So you get the money and then you, you rectify it. Mm -hmm. And all I did was, if you can see those downspouts, those beautiful downspouts, it's yeah. 35,000 <laughs> cash back on close. So I took the 35,000 or 30,000 or something around there. And I took that. And the main thing is that you want to divert water. Right, because mm -hmm. water's coming in. You can see there's a slope yeah. going in, uh, yeah. sort of into the buildings. There's a storm drain right there, but all of this, that's a parapet wall, but those are the scuppers. So all the water was actually running, and this downspout, it has a downspout going in, basically going out. Uh, it was disconnected actually, and going in back into the building, oh, wow. mm -hmm. right? So all I did was, I just added one, two, three, four, five, six, seven downspouts, and I diverted all the water back to the front. Um, to the uh, to the drains to the storm drains and that was it that solved everything Boom. so yeah. that cost me two that wasn't 35 grand. <laughs> it wasn't 30, yeah it wasn't 35 grand but that's what you have to do you first say okay there's a problem solve the situation where you can divert yeah. the water out right so you leveraged that back to get you that cash back deal yeah because it's beautiful because I didn't know what what the problem was I knew yeah. there was water Right? Yeah, but first you have to solve the initial problem. Secondary problem is that you're getting water in the basement, yeah, right? But the initial sure. problem is that water is getting in. Stop that source yeah. and see what happens. If even if it does, like even if I had to use the 30, 35,000, I would have to use it, right? If I diverted the water and it still happened, I would still have to waterproof that, right? So mm -hmm. that's my next step. Yeah. That's my next stage. Is that yeah. I do all this? I'm gonna have to um, excavate, waterproof it. That's probably about five thousand, right? Probably mm -hmm. about five thousand dollars. Probably get some. Uh, no, I, I outsource all that. I don't do it. Anymore. Yeah. I outsource all that. Get that waterproof, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that hopefully that solves it. Yeah. Right. Because maybe there's underground water. Something. Something's happening. Yeah. Right. But again, very like for for me, I'm looking at. Um, you look at the numbers. You're looking at the location. You're looking at the building. You're looking at any kind of deferred maintenance. You're putting all that into into that piece, right? Mm -hmm. That you're analyzing, right? You don't just say, okay, well, it's just cheap. It's 1.35 mil. Yeah. I'm gonna go buy it. No, no, no. Dude, step back. Like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. It's falling over. Yeah, if it's, it's falling over, cheap. yeah, it's not cheap, right? So you have to have to look at the numbers. Mm -hmm. And if you're not sure um, about the location, like, there's hard numbers that you can look at. And I always go back. This is my mate. I made yeah. up this analysis. I go, there's hard numbers, and there's uh, there's soft analysis, and there's hard analysis. Hard is the numbers. Soft analysis is this. I don't know if people talk about this. Is that um, the location you're not sure about? Sit there on a Friday night and a Saturday sure. night. Right in my car because I've done that to uh, downtown property, uh, literally just probably four months ago, and I mm -hmm. sat down on a Friday night, and then my wife calls and was like, uh, "It's 12 o'clock, man. <laughs> nothing's <laughs> happening." So I go, "Yeah, nothing's happening." So, but it depends. Like if if you're in a rough location and you don't know what's happening and you don't know the the tenants and whatnot, sit out there for a Friday night, Saturday night, see what's happening, see the tenants, see if there's a lot of street action or whatnot. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll, you you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, exactly. Inside. Right. So there's the hard numbers, then there's a soft, so, sort of the soft analysis that you have to do as well. That numbers or whatever people present to you, you're not going to see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. a great tip about yeah. sitting by the property. I've definitely done that before too. Yeah. If you want to get just a little bit more into your background, so like you mentioned you were a property manager first. Yeah. Was that part of the plan to become a real estate investor or were you a property manager and then you were like, so, oh shit, real estate investing's for me? So I sort of fell into property management. I invested first. So this is my, this is my sort of my background is, uh, I have a finance background at U of T. I work at the I worked at the bank, so TD Asset Management, CIBC Asset Management, Towers Perrin. I'm not sure if they're in existence, but the Petra <laughs> Consulting Company. Yeah. Uh, and then I actually started investing in properties. After investing in properties, then I fell into property management. Then I worked for Brookfield, Caprete, um, some boutique uh, property management companies. So I managed about 3,000 units. Oh wow. In the last probably, uh, I left work about 
five years ago, four or five years ago. Uh, but I was doing just part time, which I still like. I like property management; it's fun. If you just have all your pieces in in place, it's actually very easy. Yeah. It's very. I have to say, it's very hands off. It's because you just pick up the phone and say, "Hey, contractor." Get, you're get a dispatcher. Here. Yeah. You're yeah. the quarterback, right? Mm -hmm. Right. I'm not even throwing the ball. I'm like, "Hey, you, you call it the plays, right?" But mm -hmm. you're not even throwing the ball sometimes, right? So yeah. it's it's actually very very easy. So I went into property management. I managed um, about three thousand units. Um, I had property managers um, uh, that I had to oversee and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but that's sort of what I do. What's up guys, Matt here. Have you ever wanted to do wholesaling? Have you ever wanted to go all in on real estate investing? Well, I've heard your demands from the comment section on my YouTube video, and we're looking to hire more people to join our team. Now, this is going to be a unique opportunity. It definitely, you're going to need to fit outside of the traditional mold, but if you're willing to go all in on real estate investing, learn everything and do everything necessary to become a successful wholesaler, and you're willing to move to London, Ontario, and move into one of the mansions with me, well, let's do it. So we've got a process for you guys to be able to join our team of wholesalers. Right now, I have seven full-time wholesalers working for me in southwestern Ontario, but we actually want to grow the team even more, a lot more, in fact. But the requirements are you need to be willing to go all in. So no other jobs, no side hustles, no other personal commitments. You just need to be laser-like focused on real estate and learning and personal development because that's what this mansion's all about. In addition, you need to be willing to move to London, Ontario. I don't care where you currently live, but you need to be willing to move to London, Ontario. You need to be eligible to work in Ontario, all that good stuff. But otherwise, that's pretty much it. We're just looking for really dedicated, really hungry individuals that want to join our team. If you want to apply, send us an email, clickwholesaling at gmail.com. You're probably gonna spell click wrong, so we're throwing it up here on the screen. We'll also have a link in the video description down below. But this is a once in a lifetime opportunity guys. You've seen the evolution of Adam Martin from my team over the years. He joined us back in 2018 and he knew nothing about real estate investing. He'd never made an offer, never bought real estate, never made a dollar off of real estate and today he's absolutely crushing it. I know there's a lot of people that aspire to be the next Adam Martin. As well, you've seen the evolution of Mike and Shahir from my team and how they've grown as individuals and wholesalers as well. In fact, we've even got a whole new crop of wholesalers that you really haven't seen yet on the YouTube channel, but they'll be coming soon to a video on your newsfeed. But beyond that, we need more wholesalers. This is really a once in a lifetime opportunity. If you're serious about going all in on wholesaling real estate, I need you to join my team. Click the link down below, send us an email, and I look forward to chatting. So this is 150, 150 Hyman Street. Uh, yep. Kitchener, um, not the best location, but it is up and coming. But yes. Yeah. We'll always put our signs up, make sure that uh, we have some um, some presence, some marketing, whatnot. So people sort of see that, it gets branded, whatnot. I'm not into marketing, I don't know too much about it, but uh, people say it's good, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is 36 units. Uh, this is what, again, what I like to specialize, is two, two, two to two and a half story walk-ups. You can see that, the lower level's there. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the second and then the third. So that's a sub-basement. Um, and these are the two units. 36 units, bought it for 4.3 uh, mil. Uh, and then we sold the back half to a developer. That developer, oh, cool. he bought that house, so he yeah. fenced it up. So he's gonna actually build. That's gonna be his drive, right. driveway, Makes going sense. right to the very back. Yeah. And he bought that whole parcel of land from us. What's the, uh, the caveat of this is that um, he's gonna do some upgrades to our property as well. So he's gonna change the, uh, the, the driveway, get that repaved, redo the back part of the, uh, of the, of the lot now uh, for the garbage and the recycling, things like that. So that's already um, been negotiated on, in the contract. And we always try to you know, make it a win-win for, for, for everyone. And did you know that buying this property? Or we did. Okay. We wanted to buy this and actually buy him out. <laughs> so, but, because this is a small piece of, like, it's a small piece of land, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it's just a small little bungalow, so we were thinking that, hey, we can just buy them out, but we're not developers. We're, yeah. we're just, you know, yeah. this is simple. We know what we're getting into, um, and this makes money. At the get-go, this makes money. So my, one of my friends asked, what's your, what's your goal? And I actually said, I don't have a goal. Like, I don't have a number of units. That's what he meant. What's your yeah. goal about how many units? I, my, my wife may have that. I don't. 
Uh, mine, mine is basically, when I really thought about it, I was like, hey, what is my goal? My goal right now, because I haven't stabilized build, this building yet, is 36 units, and I'm trying to drive all the rents up to about $1,200 per unit. So 12 times 36 is whatever, 40 something thousand a month. That's what mm -hmm. my gross. So this is a value add building. Yeah. So you saw uh, my student, my student housing. Uh, that's basically student housing. Uh, get the uh, expenses down. Uh, increase the NOI. This yeah. is a value add. So let's mm -hmm. uh, let's take a look at this building. And was this on the MLS or was this private? No, this is private. Okay. So most of our uh, most of our stuff is private. Yeah. And they, do you just have a lot of realtors and brokers that yeah. keep an eye out for you? That's or? right. Yeah. You have to close. Like you have to be able to uh, to close a building and make it work. Yeah. Um, and then people will, will trust you. So we're doing some renovations. You'll see a whole bunch of garbage there. Um, let's see if come on over so again two and a half story walk-ups no elevators uh pitch roof is better than the uh because now i'm looking at shingled roof at two dollars and 75 cents per square foot instead of the 10 or 12 right yeah so this is this is a, this is an existing unit yeah um pretty gross what we do is normally uh fix up the walls paint it we do the floors um we're gonna do too much that gets regutted change the uh the toilet the vanity either we reglaze the, the tub or we try to keep the uh, the tiles or, or we get that changed and this gets all redone so tell me about your strategy here are you going to kind of keep your renos mildly low because of the nature of the area or are you going to reach up and try and pump the whole building up over time so it depends on the building and the location so sometimes you yeah. can't get that major lift so yeah. what you try to do is that um, I normally put, I don't usually do a full gut like this, yeah. but normally I do a two year payback period. What this means is that my, what I normally do is that my rents are say $900 and sure. I can jump it up to 1200. That's a $300 increase, right? Times that by 24 months. So that's uh, 7200. So that's using my budget, 7200. Okay, because I want to be able to recoup it fairly quickly. So I bought each unit for about 110,000. I'm gonna spend 7,000 dollars into it. That's 117,000 per unit. Yeah. And I'm gonna be renting so it up. Yeah, 1,200. 12, there. yeah, 12 to about 1,300. On a lower unit like this, yeah, it's gonna be 1,200. For upper units, it's gonna be an extra 50. Like if it's a two bedroom, uh, lower units 12. Upper units it can be 1,250. So I'm in. This is a beast for 1,200. Really, this big. Is it? Sorry. I, I find this. Like fairly large unit, yeah. $1,200. Yeah. And great um, windows, like yeah. everything's, everything's good. Yeah, the size is good. Everything else, uh, like from the uppers to the lowers, like they're all the same window, window size, yeah. but I will charge $50 less for something lower. Yeah, right. Um, but this is, this is how, it doesn't only come this bad. Most of these units were actually uh, renovated before. So a good half of it was already done. Yeah. This is already kind of minimized. And so, are you guys dropping the ceiling here? Or no, it shouldn't be. So I'm not sure what they did before. Um, sometimes it's new, it's like, you're like, what the heck is this? Right? Yeah. What did the previous owner do? Um, <laughs> but yeah, whatever, whatever this is, maybe they didn't want, I don't know. So I'm gonna talk to my contract and make sure everything else. Like it's not major. Yeah. That's, uh, no, it just seems strange. Like, seem strange. I guess, because like, I normally think that this is for an electrical chase or something, but it looks like they didn't even need it, right? Yeah, yeah. So, As, oh, sorry. <laughs> one of the other questions yeah. I think might be good for people to hear is like, are you using standardized materials throughout most of your yeah. buildings? Like, is it always the same paint color? It's always color? the same. It's always the same paint color. It's always the same uh, fixtures and whatnot. Um, I don't cheap out on the material. Because I'm already paying for the labor, right? Of course. So all these things will, um, the, the countertop, or not the countertop, but the, the sink, the faucets, things like that, I always put a, a nicer faucet on. I think that's something interesting, the way you phrase that, though. I haven't heard anyone say it that way. <clears throat> I'm paying for the labor, no matter what. And labor essentially costs the same whether you go high end or low end. That, on that's kind of really that interesting. Hit, that hit me too, because it's so true. Because typically your materials aren't what's costing you, right? It's it's just yeah. time to do all this work. Right. So. I just don't want to see faucets leaking or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to see, like if you get a good moan, American Standard, um, all the... Uh, um, the cartridges. The cartridges. Yeah. It, it's all free. Just go there, get a new one, yeah. get a change, right? So this is this is something very, very simple. So let's go and take a look. So this is a unit. This is actually comprised of six six plexes. Six six. Oh, okay. So you haven't seen it like like a boiler room. 
And so you mentioned that it's condoized or been kind of yeah. So essentially, like, do you see that potentially as a long-term exit, <laughs> where you uh, would like actually sell it off? Yeah, or? more like a short-term exit. Oh, okay. I want to quickly get this is supposed to be in and out, but the cash flow is very strong, right? So this is a because it's a six-six plex. This is a boiler. Uh, this is this is small. This is an old hot water tank. We always buy it. Don't rent it. Just go and buy it. It's it's cheap. Even the commercial ones are about 1500 This is a small boiler. I'm not sure how many BTUs, probably, I'm guessing, maybe 200,000 BTUs or something. Mm -hmm. I'm not even sure. I always get my mechanical contractors to, uh, uh, to service it uh, before the startup. So mechanical contractor, you also do my boilers and whatnot. So here's the boiler, here's the expansion tank. Here's the, uh, the exhaust. That's it, it's simple. Here's your meters. Yeah. Um, so when you're going through a property and doing your due diligence, like looking at buying, are you bringing through an inspector? Do you know enough? Do you bring a contractor? You always have to bring in your your, uh, your your qualified people. So a building like this, it's not a residential, so I don't get building inspectors, home inspectors. So you're gonna get your PNG, uh, structural engineer. So my friend uh, who does buildings actually, he comes in and gets everything done for me. Um, obviously it's market, like he, mm -hmm. he has to get paid, he has to put bread on the table. So you need a PNG. I get my plumbers uh, to scope the lines. I get my electricians uh, to make sure the electrical is good. And then I get my roofers uh, to make to inspect the roof. Um, if it's a shingle roof, I still get him up there because uh, he gets all my work. Um, so he's a roofer, commercial, like he does flat, um, everything. Uh, who else do I get? And That's then it. roughly what does it cost you to like say inspect a property? Okay, so to inspect the lines, I'm looking at a bow, 1200 uh, my PN it's that's probably your biggest budget um, I don't remember probably on a building like this I'm guessing yeah I, I don't have the figures again maybe five or eight thousand five thousand maybe not that much maybe five thousand then your electrician which is per hour and he's an older fella he's uh, he's retired so I pay him uh, I think it's like fifty or sixty dollars an hour um, so he does that uh, my roofer, I don't actually have to pay him, he just inspects. Yeah, because right? he gets all the work. He gets so. all the work. Um, and my mechanical contractor, excuse me, so the mechanical contractor comes in as well. So I use somebody local here um, that I've been using, I source them out, and he's good, he'll come and inspect everything, make sure everything else is good. So those are probably your good four or five people that you get individually, you don't get home inspectors. For a building, like a commercial building, you don't get a home inspector. Mm -hmm. And you, you get the you get the specialists involved. So you have your plumbers, electricians, your uh, your PNG, um, and he gets a big uh, a big book and make sure everything is is good. Right. What does so, this process take? Pretty quick. Like yeah. Again, my wife does all the analysis, so we we split it up. Um, but when she tells me, okay, well, um, we're, we're firm on this. We have to do the inspections and whatnot. Um, this can literally take a week or two. Oh, so I'll get wow. my guys. Yeah, I'll get my guys in yeah. ASAP. Um, get every you know everybody in place. And it's it's only a one day thing. So bang, one day we start at nine. We finish probably at twelve, like twelve or two o'clock. Or it doesn't take that long. But the inspection does. My my PNG does. He'll probably spend a day uh, or day and a half because I want everything inspected. I feel like that's quick too, though. Cause that's yeah. amazing, really. Well, he'll have three guys, right? Okay. So he have one lead, and then he have two helpers, right? So he they're going in and out, in and out out of all the units, everything's open. Um, and then basically, yeah, he's doing all that, right? Mm -hmm. And then make sure you scope the lines as well. So that's something that you guys have to look at. Uh, these are your sewer lines, right? Yeah. Uh, all your all your lines, make sure everything else is good. There's no slope, there's no sagging in the lines. Um, there's no roots going, uh, growing into your lines or whatnot. And that can be something to negotiate, right? You go back and say, hey, um, you know what? I found out that these lines are sagging because I've actually dealt with that. and. You can have to break up floors and do we do like sewer lines, right? So I don't want to deal with it. Scope the lines out first. That's something easy that you can do, and it literally costs you twelve hundred bucks, right? If something goes wrong, you say, hey, it's like I knew about it. I already got a cash back on clothes. I already said, hey, do you get it fixed or whatnot? Yeah. So you can negotiate on that. That's something that you should do prior to uh, taking ownership. What is up, you guys? Matt McKeever here, and so by massive popular demand. Casey's back and so I'm really excited actually Casey's going to break down for us he used to own this property he no longer even owns the property but he's going to explain to us why he sold this property and what he did with the proceeds so first of all Casey thank hey you guys. so much no everyone's just been loving everything you did so. I don't know why because like seriously 
I'm just a short little Chinese guy, like five two on a good day. Yeah, not 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 very pretty looking either. So I don't know why the uh, the hits or the views are, are so high. But let me uh, give you a quick little rundown. I started in 2003. There was a new newspaper article. Uh, that I uh, forwarded over to Matt. 2003, Global Mail uh, did a quick little um, snapshot on, on me. So I started with the triplex, downtown Toronto, 197,500. I can rhyme these off real quick. Uh, Dundas and Bloor, 896 Dundas Street, uh, Old Chinatown, and then I bought two more properties over at, uh, in London because I looked at the value. So it was uh, 70 Chapman. I'll, I'll rhyme these off. Yeah. Unit 18, 1437 Wonderland Road, near Wonderland and Sarnia. I bought that for 90. Building, yeah, yeah. 98500 I put 10% down, so $9,850 is at 10% down, and then uh, finance the rest. Downtown uh, Toronto property, 896 Dundas, I bought that for 197500 If I'm talking too fast, you can... Uh, they can slow it down. They can, you guys can slow it down. So I bought that, there's a triplex for 197500 I put down about $27,000 in rentals and upgraded the whole, well, tried to upgrade it. And then uh, that was cash flowing pretty nicely. It was uh, uh, the Gross rent, gross, gross, twenty four thousand, uh, twenty four fifty five uh, per month. And then I hit that London, and then the uh, Chapman Court was one thirty five thousand five hundred. Yeah, one hundred thirty five thousand even. Excuse me. So I bought that, and then we hit rain, and then uh, they said about the uh, the top ten towns. Kitchener Waterloo was uh, was on the top probably four or five, or and then uh, we just we just looked at it, and we delved it quickly into it. So on on the big macro perspective, I look at what business to own and what, what to do. Then after that, there's geographic location. It could be Toronto, at that time it was Toronto, then London, then KWC, and so on and so forth. So going down that little funnel, that's what you try to do, and then you funnel it down all the way to, do you want to do rent to owns, single families, duplex, whatever, small, multifamily, and then uh, bigger scale, 10 units or, or, or something bigger. This is a this is a 4448 Chapel Street. So I bought this in 2004. 2003 is when I started. I bought that triplex. I hit London. Then I hit this, and I was like, "This is pretty darn good." I'll tell you the price right now. Yeah. I bought it for 430 thousand. Wow. Ten units, okay? Yeah. So that's 43 thousand dollars. I'm not gonna like the only two, Matt. The only two properties that have VTB on yeah. was this one, and my 28 Elgin Street. Oh, okay. So these are the only two. The other ones, you always ask. Yeah. So you can tell your listeners to, you can ask. My kids always ask for ice cream at the end of dinner. Sometimes I don't give it. But so when they keep on asking, I'm like, okay. Sometimes. Sometimes I give it, right? So you, you have to ask, right? So yeah. just ask, okay? Asking doesn't hurt. So I bought this for 430000 I just walked down the street um, and up the street, and it, it's a pretty good location. There's a church there, uh, elementary school over there. Courthouse is literally a 10-minute walk. Maybe, maybe 12 minutes if you walk slow, but it's a great, great location. That's what you're looking for. I'm not looking for rough neighborhoods or uh, things that's up and coming. I want it to be already there, yeah. okay? So 430,000, I put down, this one I put down 10%, not the 12 and a half like the 28 Elgin Street. I put yeah. down 10%. They let me 15% of 430, whatever that calculation, you guys can do with that. That uh, 15%, of the purchase price is what I got that VTB. That rate was so low because I gave them several options. Again, I gave them several options. This is 2004, okay, mind you. So what I did was I said, hey, lend me um, whatever that 15%, can you give that to, lend that to me on a simple interest paid, I think it was quarterly, or oh, nice. yeah, yeah, paid quarterly, 3%, okay? Uh, interest only to the end of the, uh, to the, end of the term and uh, Basically, what you do is, for those, uh, it was a two-year term, and my financing with the bank was two years. So I can refi at that two years, take the money out from this, mm -hmm. and they give it back to the vendors. Make sense? So the vendor, there's a VTB, vendor take back. And so was this property on the MLS? This one was. Yeah. Okay. So you can find deals on MLS. Uh, you can find it directly private. Uh, usually the bigger ones, they're not going to be putting it on the market. It's because most of the landlords, they don't want it on the market. It scares the tenants, yeah. and then they leave. Okay, so you just you ha you have to have good rela relations everywhere. Yeah. And so, so you ended up selling this property. Yeah, I sold this one to get my other t uh, to get my 65 units. So we'll see that after. That's in Cambridge. Guys, real investors, real people, <laughs> real streets, yeah. real buildings, <laughs> real life. <laughs> 
Real garbage, too. Real yeah. garbage. <laughs> well, real recycling, that's nice. <laughs> okay, so let's, uh, going back to this. Yeah. Um, so I bought this in 2004. What I was looking for was a good street, something that um, it's not, it's not in a rough neighborhood because I don't want that. It's yeah. it's a headache. So I walked up and down the street and it was a good neighborhood, solid building. That time I just got a home inspector. Yeah. Um, because I didn't know all these. I had to get a PNG. The bank actually, when I got the uh, the bigger ones, the bank actually say, hey, I need a PNG, uh, a stamp on this, and a whole bunch of other. Um, contractors, so your plumbers, electricians, uh, environmental, things like that. I think we, we did an environmental for this one, but it was just a, a regular uh, house building inspector. So what I was looking for this was structurally sound, nothing major uh, in terms of electrical and plumbing. When we, when we did that, I didn't even scope the lines for these. So it looked pretty good. There was that value add, as I mentioned, that the rents can go up. Uh, I didn't know how much to, uh, to rent to do the renovations now, so I don't over-renovate. This one, I, I may have over-renovated some of them, but not all of them. Uh, a lot of the tenants were just long-term. Yeah. So what, what I mean by this is when we take a look, look at the numbers, we bought for 430,000. Usually the expense ratio, I'll give a quick snapshot and high level, it's about 40% of gross rent at the time, okay, whenever you buy. So 430, 40% of that usually is, um, overall expenses. So that includes everything, okay? So your insurance, R&M, what else? Uh, taxes, property taxes, all that. All the utilities, so you have your, except for hydro, so you have your water, um, gas, and so on and so forth. So you have all of that. So that's what you're looking for. Usually about 40%. Anything above that, it's not as efficient, okay? So that's what we're looking for. And then you can drive up that rent. Uh, don't over-renovate, I mean, don't overspend. Okay, on your renovation. So be very strategic on that. What I mean by that is that if all these houses around this street are just doing um, from like a countertops, just a regular sink, single handle lever, yeah. mowing single handle lever, painting and so on and so forth, you're not putting granite countertops. Okay, you're not putting gold faucets because the building doesn't call for that. Your tenants are your tenants are not gonna uh, you're not gonna get the better rent, the higher rent. Okay, so just don't over renovate. So when I was looking at this, everything seemed to be pretty good. Uh, solid building. It was actually a brick stucco and stucco. I had some problems with this as well, but that's going in property management. I had my boiler break down, and, um, but insurance paid for that. But overall, a very solid building. And I didn't want to sell this building to get my 28 Elgin Street, yeah. as I mentioned. So I had uh, essentially um, money here. It was 2013 when I bought Elgin. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. so I had this in 2004. So whatever that time period, I held it, uh, and I sold it for eight, about 850 thousand. And my mortgage is probably about 160, 170 thousand. So I had, I had some yeah. built-up equity. Uh, my debt was paid down, and I could have used it for my Elgin Street, but I didn't. Right. So I rather raise that money because I didn't want it. This was going to be for retirement, right? Um, so rents were about when we're looking at it, it was about. 600 to about 700 dollars 600 for the ones one bedrooms yeah. two uh 700 for the two bedrooms okay so if you just multiply that out eight one bedrooms and two two bedrooms that makes up 10 units um and you can just multiply that out and that's your rent minus your expenses you can do that calculation i just don't remember it right now um and then yeah that's that's obviously the uh the cash flow if you can see that and then it actually goes up over time. Yeah. So how do you make the decision between like selling or trying to refinance just to get access to that cash? Good question. Because sometimes if you refinance, you're not able to get refinance high enough. Make sense? Yeah. Because the, the, the building uh, doesn't support that new value. All right. Mm -hmm. So let's just say I bought for 430. My, uh, my, uh, my mortgage is at 170,000. Now I want to refinance up to 800. Mm -hmm. Okay, or even a million. They're not going to give that to me because it's based on that income. How much that building is generating, right? So if it's not generating a lot, let's just say my tenants, some of my old tenants been there for a while and it's only um, uh, $700 or maybe $750. I can't get the full value of that million dollars, okay? Because now they're only going to give me up to $600,000 yeah. or $700,000. So for me to get access to the bulk of that money is to sell. So that's why some... There's a question on the comments. They're, they're saying, why did, the, why did the, the person sell? Well, this is the reason, because I was selling to upgrade. Yeah. You know, sometimes you have to sell a few 
to get the bigger ones. So you, I always want to hold. I never want to sell. Of course, like you're making money. That's the uh, the goose that's laying the gate, uh, golden egg. And you never want to sell, but sometimes you actually do have to to upgrade. Like this is my first time doing a YouTube uh, these YouTube videos, and look at these comments, and they're, they're actually pretty rude. Some of these some of these guys will say, oh, "I must have some wealthy family or whatever." Let me talk about that. I grew up in Scarborough. Okay, Scarborough is you can look it up. But I grew up in Malvern. My parents came from Hong Kong way back in night. 1973. Not that much money. My parents uh, was educated. My dad was an engineer, but he came here. He was a draftsman. My mom worked at Leech Videos, troubleshooting motherboards. Um, so middle class, semi-detached home in Scarborough, Malvern. Whatever, just normal, regular people, right? So my parents didn't have any money. My grandparents, um, they pushed a dim sum cart until they're like 60 years. Let's go. That's enough fluff. That's enough fluff. Sounds good. Yeah, let's check out some properties. Yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> awesome, guys. We're going to check out some of Casey's properties. In fact, we're going to see the property he sold this one for. So I'm pumped. You guys should be pumped too. At the start of 2016, four years ago, I literally was a ghost on social media. Back in 2016, no one knew who I was. No one other than maybe my parents and best friends knew I was a real estate investor. In my real estate business now, I legit only sell on social media. I do not sell anything else. I don't care about a sign. I don't print off any pieces of paper and hand it to you. Only social media. I've built my entire real estate agent business off social media. Over the course of one single Instagram live video where I was walking through a property, I was actually able to raise $80,000. Today, four to 5,000 people watch me every single day on YouTube. A thousand people will watch my stories on Instagram. You know, over 500 will watch my stories on Facebook. I just envision that as how could I possibly talk to 5,000 people a day one-on-one? -on -one? People lend me money for my real estate investments. If you didn't know, myself and Matt McKeever are in the apartment buying business right now and we're buying a lot of units. So people lend us money for renovations, for deposits, and we pay interest on that. And I often share the interest of payments on Instagram, which leads to more people reaching out to me wondering how they can get involved. And because of that, I was able to raise almost a million dollars within the last 90 days basically taking this business from zero to now we've done over 1.4 million dollars in sales this year and it's all been through social media I've been actually able to attract all six of my top performing wholesalers and my back-of-house staff through social media okay all of it has been done through there and by showing the process the printing press tele and radio communications the internet and then social media these are the four big media revolutions that just changed the game as we know it. And right now, I'm in a giant land grab to try and get my hands on as much of the social media attention world as possible. If you guys are not on social media, you have to do it. I don't care if you're a restaurant, you're an insurance agent, you're a real estate agent, you need to be on social media. It's the easiest way to branch out and talk to so many people. If there was only one thing I could tell you guys, the one thing I would tell you is start today. Okay, yesterday was the best time to start. In fact, when you first even thought about your business idea, that was the best time to start. But the next best time is right now. If you start posting and start publishing your story today, I guarantee you, you will have results from social media so long as you stay consistent. So come and get your social proof. just following Casey right now to the 65 unit building. I thought what better opportunity now that my hands, I have some feeling back in them because it is cold, it's Canada. But I want to talk to you guys. So Casey kind of touched upon it just a little bit in that video and I'm going to include it. But at the end of the day, what you guys need to realize when you're watching these videos, these are legitimately real people. Like they don't necessarily want to put themselves out in front of strangers in the internet just to have jerks or trolls hit them up and make complaints and I get it I know some of you are frustrated because you look at someone like Casey who's extremely successful very well put together and it's hard to necessarily envision ourselves becoming Casey I get it it's really difficult but the thing is by having those limiting beliefs by being like oh he must have been lucky he must have had family money you know he must have never earned it a day in his life that's 
yeah. if you believe that to be true, it's going to be true about yourself as well. And so it's really important that you guys like sit down and really listen to what he's saying. Listen to the minutia, the facts, and even the non-verbal things he's saying. He knows exactly what he's talking about. If he came from family money, he would not know all these tips and tricks that I'm like hanging off of every word on. So anyways, if you guys got value from this video, smash that like button. And if you watch this video all the way to the end, you owe it to Casey to leave a nice comment. I want you guys to leave a nice comment for Casey so that not only for Casey's sake but for future guest sakes because if they come on and watch these videos and they see tons of hate in the comments and I don't like to leave in comments because I also don't think that that's a good thing either but we need more positivity get in those comment sections share your positivity let's give Casey a huge thank you because he's changing my life he's changing Adam's life and just thanks again Casey so here the here the washing uh Here's the laundry area, the washing machines and, and the dryers. It used to be only a pair here, and Coinomatic used to be here. So when, when I bought this building, uh, Coinomatic is usually in here. The reason why I get rid of them is that, again, they take about 50% off the top line. So it's very expensive for an owner to, a small owner like myself, uh, to absorb that. I always buy it used um, and get my own in here. So this building, makes a shitload of money on laundry okay and you'll see my other building uh it's a little bit different layout's a little bit different not as much uh but good money as well and usually in all three build like this one my pressman property on moore street my hymen and then my elgin street in total i'm looking about three thousand dollars a month just in coins so, so just in coins so people will say why am i spending whatever my my day gathering yeah. fifty dollars or twenty dollars no it's it's a it's, a, it's a significant so that three thousand dollars anywhere from about twenty five to three thousand dollars is significant enough that i don't want somebody else to count the money because that money will be go like that it will be missing really really quickly yeah. right so that's something that you as an owner have to have control so your top line you control that so once you get that money all the other stuff when you pay it's a lot easier right so rent nobody no nobody accepts cash okay so my superintendents will say hey okay I got cash from this person no no, no. what happens if that superintendent got jumped right mm -hmm. he lost the money he spent the money right yeah and in my earlier days I had that happen once where he got robbed yeah yeah and how do you prove that right he got robbed and like dude that doesn't happen mm -hmm. so you make it very easy for a tenant to pay it could be pre-authorized um, I don't like e-transfers, but sometimes e-transfers is a must. Uh, let's say I have all my mortgages with a bank. It's BMO. And there's no bank beside it but TD. Open up a TD account there. Get them to deposit in the TD and wire it over to your BMO. Right? It's, all, it's as simple as that. Give them the account. They have to put it into the account. They, they take pictures and so on and so forth. That You make sure that you get your money. Right? If it's not on the first, then you issue out that N4 the next day. The second or the third, the N4 gets sent out. After that, those 20 days, then the L1 gets sent out. So don't, don't do not delay on those um, those notices, and make sure that the tenants know that you're on track of these things. Okay, so going back, this, this is a laundry. I put these ones in. Um, $1,200 for pair, washer and dryer, so $600 each. Uh, we just have some issues. We just put them in. Um, literally about a week ago, two weeks ago. So the ventilation is not very good and we're trying to work that out because it's not venting properly. There's always issues. There's always issues with buildings, um, but it's always manageable. You have to be able to get your contractors to you know, troubleshoot things and do things properly, right? Um, but again, so this, this you know, makes money. Um, always buy it. My, my sort of my, my management office is right there. People can drop off checks and I have a camera right there that you can see this, see this room. There's one gentleman who was talking about uh, trading, uh, making more income than properties. That's cool. I, uh, I think it was Patterson, Dave or Steve Patterson, right? And he was saying that his uh, return was a lot better um, doing trading. And he talked about hyperinflation, 11%. Uh, Matt's smiling right now. I was like, wow, that's... Uh, and so Casey, it's... Uh, um, when you refi my Elgin property, because what happened was that I refinanced it just in November, 
okay? But I didn't do it three years. I did a 10 year, all right? And I fixed my interest at three and a half percent. Oh wow, Yeah. that's fantastic. So I mitigate that risk, right? So I did a five year with Community Trust and these, there's another comment stating that um, it's too good to be true that I'm doing it 35 years, right? And it's CMHC. You have to do your research, all right? So this, these two companies, go and, go and contact these, th these two companies. It's called MPAC, M-P-A-C, probably heard of them. Yeah. First National, they offer that, CMHC loans at 35 years. So if I can find it, short little Chinese guy can find it, you can find it too. It's not, seriously, you gotta, you gotta network, you gotta find it, you gotta pick up the phone call, pick up the phone and call people, right? Your A-level banks may not have those, you know, those, uh, those different types of uh, packages or lending, whatever. It's like, it's, it's kind of creative, right? But they don't have the CMHC. So these are uh, second tier, they would have it. So look, look out for them. So MPAC and CMHC. Um, they do have the 35 years. So what I did was that, listen, I had the five years at Elgin, then I push it out. What I do is that you can do this. Very, it's very normal, this is not rocket science. You push it back out to 10 years. So I paid off, let's say my mortgage is at 2.5 million, right? I bought it for 3.15, my mortgage is at, let's say 2.5. Now, instead of that 20 years, because I paid off five years, I'm gonna talk a little slower now. I'm gonna push it back out to 35 years. That drops my payments down, does it not? So when I talked about pushing it out, this is what I'm talking about. So from the 20 years, because it paid off five years, normally it's 25 year M, amortization. Now it's at 20. Now I'm gonna go back to MPAC and say, hey, let's push it back out to 35 years. What is that gonna to do to my monthly payment uh, uh, costs? It's gonna drop that, right? Now I cash flow higher, make sense? So now my cash flow is higher. Now I can feed my family every month, right? I don't need $3 million after 20 years. Do you know what I'm saying? I don't need cash flow after 20 years. I paid off five years. There's another 20 years. I don't need, what is it? Uh, uh, that extra uh, 17, dollars $17, or when my mortgage is done, let's say everything, I don't need 15,000. Okay, I'm grossing 27. I don't need 15,000 each and every month. After 20 years, I don't need that. Right? I need it now. I need my 10,000 now. I need this one. I need like uh, maybe it's cash flowing about 15 or 20,000. It's about 15 to 20,000. I don't need. I don't need more later. I don't need 30,000. I need 40,000 later. I need it now, right? Because I have to live now. I still have to eat from now to my 20 years. So that's that's something that strategic that uh, investors will do. So going back to this uh, Patterson person, right? Listen, if you can make more, that's amazing. I will invest in you. All right, but if you're saying that hyperinflation is 11%, that's good forecasting. You, you might be right or you might be wrong. But dude, if you've been investing, because I looked at your, your, your website or, or one of your videos, you said you've been investing for 35 years. Let me see just 20 years of your performance. Dude, show it to me. I'll show you mine, right? Show me yours, all right? So if you can show me on your portfolio, in your statements, that you've been climbing from 100,000, two, three, four, five, to $20 million over the last 20 years, dude, I'm gonna invest in you. But you, if you're gonna say something that bold, you gotta back it up, dude, back it up. So I'll back mine up because I'll show you my returns. I'll show you my buildings. You can touch it, feel it, hug it. I wanna touch and feel it and hug your statements, man. If you can give me those returns at whatever percentage, and you can predict, when you predict something like that, so you can predict the 2008, 2009 financial uh, uh, downfall, and you made money on it, dude, you should be on Bay Street or on Wall Street, all right? But I know you're smart, okay, because you kept all those statements for 35 years. Show me just 20 years. The last 20 years, I'll invest in you, and I'll get more people to invest in you if you can show me those, state, those returns, show it to me, all right? So let's, let's move on. I just love it. So you gotta show me those returns. But now, if you're, I looked at McDonald's, because I want to do, I want to be in McDonald's operator. I want to be a Tim Hortons owner. Yeah. That's what I want to do way back before my Elgin property. So before that, looked at that. I didn't even get in. I don't know why they didn't select me. Because I actually don't, I had the money, but I didn't have an operating partner. I was, I was looking for an operating partner because I had some buildings, but I couldn't find an operating partner. So look, so this is high level. Are you gonna go do real estate? Are you gonna trade? Are you gonna buy a franchise? So on and so forth. Because I like systems, because I'm not, dude, I was, everything's everywhere. It's hard for you to, 
to do work your systems, right? Or to make your system. So McDonald's for me was good because I had a young family. Uh, I just need an operating partner, had the money, but I didn't have an operating partner. Uh, but that fell through and then I just got Elgin. Um, but yeah, high level, if real estate's not for you, that's fine, that's cool, you're not gonna hurt my feelings. Come down, uh, what type of geographic location? So what I did was, I did Toronto, uh, Triplex. Then I did London, because cash flow was strong. Appreciation was low. Your capital appreciation was low in London, mm -hmm. uh, relative to other areas, you have to compare. Then I hit Hamilton. When I hit Hamilton, uh, about three buildings, in a rough neighborhood uh, near Main and Gage, and I lost a shitload of money. You can ask me what shitload means later, but a shitload of money. And I actually paid my investors back. They're my friends, they're actually from my church, and I lost that money. I know you're not Christian, Matt, so don't worry. Uh, you don't hurt my feelings. So um, I lost a shitload of money in Hamilton in three buildings, two eights, one twelve. All right. So I cut my losses, I was bleeding about $9,000. I sold my RSPs to cover heat, hydro, whatever, right? For, for those buildings and they were like scamming me. So I lost money in Hamilton. Um, I quickly sold those, cut my loss, I lost about, that shitload was 400K. I lost two, my investors lost two. I paid them back, um, they're 200,000. Some of my friends said, you're crazy. My, one of my lawyer friends said, uh, from high school, he said, you're crazy, dude. Um, but whatever it's like you can always earn money right but sometimes the friendship you don't want to lose and reputation and reputation right listen i can always make the money all right nothing wrong with losing a little bit uh keeping the friendship and earn it back somewhere else okay but i'm not gonna lose a friendship over over some money okay mm -hmm. so i did that I kept my own uh holdings i continued to work my wife was working she's a ca um and then we you know saved up and we paid that off Right, um, and then fast forward it, uh, having a family, four kids, um, 2013 rolled around, and then started investing in more. Okay, that's when I, the, the, the 2004 to 2013, 14 ish, uh, I was working for Brookfield, Cap Reit, I was a director there, um, worked for a whole bunch of uh, boutique property management companies, I have to say 360 Community Management, what good friend Chris Anapas worked there. Um, he's part of like Atmo and stuff. I learned a lot from everywhere I went, I learned a lot. Um, so this is just the proper property management side of it. And working for companies is easy, okay? Because they have their own systems. When you come into, come into property management companies, they have their own little systems, they have their own contractors. Um, the ARAP, so easy. Okay, when you come into something like this, even if you're in the property management business as an, as an employee, getting into something else on your own, you have to find people, work with people, or uh, get something here or there, and then make your own system, right? So this is my system of, of, of working. Um, and you know, there's, there's a lot to it. I just don't know what you guys wanna know, and you know, it just sort of comes out as, oh, this is what I do, and this is what, this is what worked in the past, right? So, but yeah, that's my sort of taken going through that geographic location, going back to Hamilton, uh, London, you know, that's what I did for student housing. Um, then I hit Barrie as well. This is before actually my Ham Hamilton buildings, I hit Barrie, I did rent to owns there. So I touched upon rent to owns. The only thing is that what I didn't like about rent to owns is that you have to sell it, right? You have to get rid of it. Um, nothing wrong with it. Some people are doing very, very well in rent to owns. The only thing is that the model didn't work for me because now I'm constantly buying, right? <clears throat> and you always want to be able to uh, hold your properties as long as possible. What I say, here's my rule of thumb, is you're gonna hold for at least five years. Don't, don't, don't take any of the cash flow out. When you reach that five years, you, you, you assess it, okay? You can refi it, you can do something or, um, but you'll know, you'll know that business because you're gonna make or break it within five years. After that five years, the 10 years time period, you're gonna make a shitload of money. That 10 years, once you get over that hurdle, so you're Matt, you're 33? Yeah. So Adam, you're about 24? Yeah. Okay, that's amazing. Think about 10 years from now. You'll be 43, you'll be my age, right? Yeah. You'll be a, uh, I'm just joking. No, I, I love the fact that you're exactly 10 years older because it's just so much yeah. fun for yeah. when I'm thinking like, who do I want to be 10 we're years from now? Yeah, right? you want to be a short Chinese guy, right? <laughs> so, so listen, that's what it is, 10 years. So Adam, dude, he's 24, he's 34, he's gonna be kicking ass. All right, um, I didn't have anybody to say, hey, what should I do or whatever, and, but I just quickly learned, right? You network, you, I was in property management, I take a look at what Capri did, 
I ask contractors how much they, you know, how much are you getting paid for this, right? So you quickly ask. You can, you can learn really quickly in a company because they streamline it so easily for you, right? You can ask them, hey, how much is the paint? How much is this or how much is that? All right, well, I'm guessing if you made it to the end, you enjoyed this video, and I'm hoping you already smashed that like button, but if you didn't, please do so. I'm hoping you're already subscribed, but if you're not, click that button as well. If you guys wanna watch more amazing compilation videos of some of your favorite Canadian real estate investors and influencers, we've got another compilation here, and another compilation right there. I'm looking forward to releasing a lot more of these videos for you guys in the future.